America has given the green light for F-16s to be sent to Ukraine and a suspected Russian spiring has been broken up in the UK. My name is Jerome Starkey. I'm the defence editor for The Sun newspaper, and this is your weekly roundup of the most important news from the war in Ukraine. We'll start by talking about the spy games because there's been a lot happening on the espionage front. Now, this is far behind the front lines. It's not even in Ukraine. It's happening in the UK and it's happening in Moscow and it's happening in Poland. In the UK, a suspected Russian spying comprising five Bulgarian nationals has been disrupted by a combination of MI5 and counter espionage police. Five Bulgarian nationals were arrested under the Official Secrets Act as part of a major national security investigation. Three of them have subsequently been charged uh, under the Identity Act for holding uh, false, what appear to be false uh, identity documents, passports, press cards uh, with intent to do harm. Now, these nationals have been living in the UK for a long period of time, up to possibly even more than 10 years leading what appeared to be, to all intents, very normal, boring, suburban lives. We understand one of them had even baked a cake for her neighbours. Some of them had been involved in uh, helping fellow Bulgarians to settle in the UK. Now, you know, as yet, these charges are very much unproven. They haven't gone to court. But this will be a concern for Russia. If this is indeed what it appears to be, if this is indeed a Russian spiring, then the concern for the Kremlin will be twofold. One is how was this group compromised? How did uh, Western intelligence agencies, MI5 and British police get wind of this operation? And as a consequence of that, what other operations may also have been compromised? Now, it's not clear what sort of level these suspected spies may have been operating at, if indeed they are proven to be Russian spies. The suggestions are that these might have been what are known as facilities agents, people who provide resources for other agents coming in to operate on British soil. Indeed, they may have been providing facilities for uh, Russian agents operating across Europe because these Bulgarian nationals would have had freedom of movement across the EU from the UK. Now, it comes as more details have emerged today of a Russian spy ring operating in Poland. Polish authorities have arrested a number of suspected Russian spies, including at least 12 Ukrainian nationals who were refugees who had fled the war in Ukraine when Russia invaded last year. Now, this organization appears to have been carrying out uh, a a range of low-level activities thought to be initially just propaganda, posting pro-Russian, anti-NATO messages and posters uh, around around Poland, trying to sort of build up anti-Ukrainian and indeed anti-NATO sentiment. But new revelations reported in the Washington Post today suggest that actually uh, their tasks were getting more sinister and severe. Uh, They were plotting arson attacks, they were plotting an assassination, and they were attempting to derail trains carrying Western weapons quite possibly carrying British weapons across Poland to the front. Now, the Washington Post has described this as the most serious threat from Russia on NATO soil since the start of the Russian invasion 18 months ago. It's worth considering the timings of all of these arrests and whether or not they are linked. The Russian spying in Poland was first disrupted in at the beginning of March this year. Now, a couple of weeks later, the U.S. journalist Evan Gershkovich was arrested in Russia on trumped up spying charges, and he remains wrongly jailed uh, in Moscow, facing up to 20 years in prison. Now, we know that there are talks ongoing between Washington and Moscow about a possible prisoner swap. At the other end of the spectrum from these rather clumsy operations in Poland and potentially clumsy operations in the UK, although we still don't know enough about what was going on in the UK. At the other end of the spectrum is the case of a Russian illegal who was uh, exposed and arrested in the Netherlands and deported to Brazil. Now, this man, Sergei Cherkasov, is accused of being a GRU deep cover illegal. Now, that means he'd spent more than a decade 
developing a false identity. He had posed as a Brazilian citizen. He had posed as a man called Victor Muller Ferreira. And he once he'd established that identity in, in Brazil, he traveled to North America where he'd studied and he was trying to infiltrate the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Now, of course, that court is significant because it has indicted President Vladimir Putin for war crimes. It is fair to say that a man like Viktor Cherkasov is at the opposite end of the scale. He is one of Russia's most valued spies in the sense that he, it's taken him a lot of effort, it's taken them a lot of resource to develop his cover to try and give him the freedom of movement to carry out the operations he was attempting. Away from espionage and back in the war, America, the White House has, we understand, given the green light for Denmark and the Netherlands to export their F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine. Now, this is significant because these are American jets and any country that operates them cannot re-export them to a third country without America's approval. Now, that approval is absolutely key. These countries had already expressed a willingness to send their fighter jets to Ukraine, but they couldn't do it without American permission. Ukraine has said that F-16 fighter jets will be absolutely key to its success on the battlefield. So this is good news for Ukraine, but of course should be tempered with the fact it may take many months, even up to a year before these fighter jets arrive. Uh, Ukrainian pilots are already in the process of beginning their training, but that will continue to take time. So this is going to be a slow process for Ukraine. In the rest of the counteroffensive, Moscow woke up today to yet another drone attack on the capital and a oil depot in the Russian port of Novorossiysk is this afternoon ablaze. While the cause of that blaze is not yet known, it would appear to fit into the pattern of Ukrainian attacks against Russian logistics. In northeastern Ukraine, in the northeastern front at Kupiansk, Russia continues its devastating artillery bombardments. Now, we understand up to 500 Ukrainian civilians have been evacuated from Kupiansk as it comes under continued and sustained devastating bombardments from Russia. That continues to be, we understand, the focus of Russia's offensive operations. They are trying to push forward in Kupiansk. Meanwhile, Ukraine continues its main efforts to push forward in the east around Bakhmut, where we've seen Ukrainian soldiers making progress, slow but significant progress, to the south of Bakhmut, particularly around a village called Kishkivka, and of course Ukraine's other main effort in the south and east, in southern Donetsk and in Zaporizhia. Now there we've seen Ukrainian marines take what is left of a hamlet called Urozhen. There's not really much left of it, so it's a pretty small hamlet, and Ukraine has been focusing a lot of their marine effort there, their marines effort there, I should say, their marine fighting infantry. Uh, this is a, a four or five road hamlet, but it is a significant advance in the direction of Mariupol. Meanwhile, in a place called Robotne, uh, south of Orekhiv, in the main Zaporizhia front, we've seen advances and a real concentration of Ukrainian force. This is interesting because Ukraine has committed its 82nd Air Assault Brigade and its 46th Air Assault Brigade to defeat the Russian garrison at Robotny. Now, the 82nd, we know, is operating the squadron of UK Challenger 2 tanks. It also has German-made Marda infantry fighting vehicles and US 8x8 striker vehicles. Now, this concentration of force is both good news and bad news for Ukraine. It's good news because it brings a lot of force, a lot of power into the battlefield. It may also be a sign that Ukraine's commanders believe that they found the crack in order to exploit in the Russian front lines. But it's bad news because these were two of the most formidable fighting units in reserve, in Ukraine's strategic reserve. And once they've been committed, it clearly means uh, there's less fighting force in reserve to call on in future as the battle progresses. Uh, other significant developments is that in both in Bakhmut and in Robotny, there have been reports of Russian Ka-52 alligator helicopters being shot down, some dramatic footage of one of those helicopters being struck by a missile. Those attack helicopter gunships had been causing Ukraine a lot of problems, especially at the start of their counteroffensive in June. And it does appear, as we've said before on these updates, that Ukraine is finding ways to bring its air defense missiles forward as its troops advance to make it difficult for those helicopters, indeed difficult, deadly or impossible for those helicopters to operate. Uh, not a really good question from you uh, from last week. Thank you very much. First on the list from uh, Mrs. Phillips is why 
Are the missiles that are launched over the Caspian Sea not being destroyed? Is it too far? It's a really good question and there's not a simple answer. The Caspian is beyond the range of Ukraine's air defence missiles. But the way air defence works is that they shoot down missiles when they are within their range. So what you have in Ukraine, and this is what was happening when I was there last week, is the minute certain Russian aircraft take off, be it over the Caspian or be it over Belarus or be it over other airfields in Russia, the air raid sirens in Ukraine sound because those aircraft could potentially launch their missiles at targets almost anywhere in Ukraine. Once those missiles are in range of Ukraine's air defense systems, and they will do their best to shoot them down. Different missiles have different capabilities. Ukraine has been open about the fact that some Russian missiles, uh, particularly the Kinzhal dagger that was known as the hypersonic that Putin had boasted, the unstoppable missile. Uh, Ukraine had been clear some of those were very difficult to defeat, but the advent, the arrival of the US Patriot uh, air defense systems has meant that even the Kinzhal missiles can be shot down. But Ukraine are repeatedly saying it doesn't have enough air defense, it wants more, because it can't have all of the air defense capability in all of the regions that are under threat. So that is why some missiles and some Shahid drones continue to get through. Uh, Dan San Pedro asking whether, given that the Dnipro River has dropped so much because of the destruction of the Novokhovka Dam, if it were to freeze in the winter, do we think that Ukrainian heavy armor may be able to cross uh, an assault onto the left bank? It's a very good question. Uh, clearly, that will depend on weather conditions. And it could, while it could well be possible, an important thing to note about any kind of advantage from the river levels dropping is, of course, that advantage will be open to both sides to try and traverse the land. We know that at the moment, Ukrainian forces have made gains onto the left bank of the river around Kherson, particularly upstream of Kherson. Russian officials have been talking about that just today. The challenge the Ukrainians have faced is that whilst they've been crossing in small teams on small boats, they haven't been able to bring heavy armour with them. That could change in the winter. But of course, if it does, and also if the grounds, those marshy, mosquito-ridden islands, if the ground there freezes, that will make it easier to operate. But it will make it easier for both sides. Carl Williams asking, do I think it was a sea drone that hit the Kerch Bridge the first time it was struck? Of course, that was at the end of last year. It's a good question. And we know that Ukraine has publicized the fact that it's been using sea drones. It's revealed the footage. It's published the footage of these drones striking ships. Uh, it's talked about a drone called the Sea Baby. Now, when the first strike on the Kerch Bridge took place, you may remember there was very dramatic footage of, from a CCTV camera showing a lorry driving over the bridge that suddenly uh, appeared to erupt in a fireball, suggesting that perhaps it was a truck bomb. But straight away, there were demolition experts suggesting that the shape and structure of the damage to the bridge, it damaged the road bridge and it set the adjacent railway bridge afire. Uh, people suggesting that the, the nature of that damage would have been very hard to cause with a truck bomb and you may well have needed explosives underneath. Um, I don't claim to be expert enough to be certain. I think clearly it's possible. It appears also, though, that these maritime drones have developed both in capability uh, and accuracy over the course of the war. So we may, you know, the, the full details of how that bridge was damaged in that first strike, uh, you know, may, may take time to come out. Uh, and the final couple of questions, can Ukrainians find a way to get through minefields and will they find a way to get behind the Russian lines? Well, these are absolutely priorities number one and number two for the counteroffensive. We've been told that in some places there are three to five mines in every square meter. That is thousands and thousands, possibly millions of mines across the front line. These range from you know, large anti-tank mines to smaller anti-personnel mines to much smaller uh, butterfly mines, um, all of which can do you know, significant damage to individuals and heavy vehicles as they try to advance. So Clearing those mines has been a priority. We know Ukraine is looking at a number of different tactics. Um, that includes clearing by hand. That includes clearing by demolition. Uh, they're trying to create the paths uh, to get into battle. The challenge with that, of course, is that these minefields are well marked and well known to the Russians, and they are coming under intense artillery fire. Objective number two is that once, if and when Ukraine can breach the Russian front lines, then there is uncertainty as to how much strength and depth they will find behind that initial line. And so what their hope would be is to find a crack, to punch a hole, and then to pour through it and to disrupt the Russians from behind that front line where they would hope to meet less resistance and be able to cause 
uh, spread panic and chaos and have more success at a lower cost in terms of um, their own losses and lives uh, on the Ukrainian side. Thank you very much for watching. We'll be coming back with the next episode in two weeks time. Uh, if you have any questions, then please do ask them in the comments below this video and we will do our best to answer them. Uh, thank you very much. And until next time.